But now I'm going to put these Lorentz contractions and time dilations into some practical tests. Hello everyone and welcome to my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan, I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And today I would like to start with a story. A story that actually happened many centuries ago to Galileo. So according to the legend, Galileo was sailing across the sea with his parrot. And they were sitting in a cabin and suddenly parrot left the cage, took off and started to fly around the cabin without any visible problems. And that made Galileo think. And he realized that motion of the ship clearly does not affect any of the physics inside the cabin. And that's why the parrot can fly without any difficulties. And he formulated that as a fundamental principle, something that we nowadays call a Galilean principle of relativity and it underlies all of the contemporary theories. And according to that principle, if you move with a constant velocity but no acceleration, then that motion does not affect any of your physics. That means that motion is only relative. Uh, you cannot just move, you can only move with respect to something. If an observer moves without acceleration, and we call that observer inertial, then that observer is completely indistinguishable from any other inertial observer, simply because they share all the same laws of physics. And this may seem like something simple and straightforward. In fact, we have already used that principle several times in the derivation of Lorentz transformations without even knowing it or stating it. And therefore, when we discover in a few episodes what are the consequences of that innocent principle, I assure you that all of you will be pretty shocked. Okay, so let us start with some basics. Take the usual Lorentz transformation and let us find an easy way to invert it. Well, first of all, we can just invert the equations directly, it's not very difficult. But there is an even easier way to do that. So all you have to do is just to invoke the Galilean principle of relativity and notice that when you make a transition from the moving frame to the resting frame, it simply corresponds to making a Lorentz transformation that corresponds to a velocity minus v instead of v. So all you really have to do is just to flip the sign of velocity. So we have begun the whole course with an idea that light moves with the same speed for all inertial observers. And that led us to the observation that the mathematical expression c squared delta t squared minus delta x squared minus delta y squared and minus delta z squared is the same for all inertial observers. It doesn't change when you apply Lorentz transformation. And therefore it makes sense to define this combination of coordinates as a new quantity. We will call that quantity a space-time interval between two events separated by delta t, delta x, delta y, and delta z. And that space-time interval between any two events has to be the same for all inertial frames of reference. And this fact is very important, because if two events are separated by a space-time interval that is greater than zero, that means that those two events can be linked by a signal, something that moves with a speed smaller than c. So the first event could cause the second one. There could be a causal connection between those two. And more importantly, that causal connection will be preserved in all reference frames, because space-time interval has the same value in all frames. Similarly, if two events are separated by a space-time interval that is smaller than zero, then those two events have to be completely independent. And the lack of causal connection between those two events will characterize them in any other reference frame. So it is time to do something really cool. So let us consider a pair of inertial observers. The first resting one will be using unprimed set of coordinates. And he also has his own clock that measures time t. The other observer that will be using primed coordinates and his clock will measure some other time t prime will be moving along the x-axis with the velocity v. 
And this is the usual setting that we will be using by default in all of this lecture course. And now let us ask a cool question. What is the relation between the rate of the moving clock that measures t prime with the rate of the resting clock that measures t? And to find that relation, we will invoke the inverse Lorentz transformation for the temporal coordinate t. And as usual, you can add the delta symbols because our transformation is linear. We can now notice that the moving clock in its own reference frame, the primed one, is actually at rest, which means that delta x prime for that clock has to be equal to zero. And that's really all we have to do to find the relation between the rates of our two clocks. And here's the stunning result. The resting clock measures delta t that is larger than delta t prime measured by the moving clock, which means that the clock in motion is actually ticking at a slower rate. Okay guys, we just got ourselves time dilation, an effect that makes all the moving clocks h slower. So since we already digested this crazy interpretation of motion as a hyperbolic rotation of space-time, we should not be surprised by time dilation effect at all. And the reason for this is very simple. If I take any object and rotate it and take a photograph, it comes out shorter. Therefore, if I'm looking at a moving clock that measures distances in time, then since my perspective is space-time rotated, those distances are also shorter. And the effect is completely universal. It affects all types of clocks the same way. For example, if I'm moving, my watch is getting slower, my heartbeat is getting slower, and even my hair grows slower. And since the rotation of space-time affects both space and time, we should see the same effect for the length measurements of moving objects. Let's have a look at another crazy result. Now, instead of analyzing what happens to a moving clock, let's analyze what happens to a moving ruler that has a length delta x prime in its own co-moving frame. And let us ask what is the length of that ruler in the resting frame, let's call it delta x. And to find the relation between delta x prime and delta x, we will now invoke a Lorentz transformation for the spatial coordinate x. And again, uh, we can add delta symbols because the equations are linear. We are now asking the question what is the length of the ruler in the unprimed frame of reference, in which the ruler is moving with velocity v. So we have to compute the difference of positions of the ends of the ruler, delta x, at the same time, which means that delta t has to be equal to zero. So that's the place where it is easy to make a mistake. Whenever you make a measurement of a moving object, like this ruler here, you have to make sure that you measure position of both ends at the exact same time, simultaneously. Why is that? Well, simply because if you make the measurement of the first end first, and after a while you make a measurement of the other end, the ruler will move in between of those measurements and falsify the results. So you have to make sure your measurements are simultaneous. And since simultaneity is relative and depends on the choice of the observer, you have to pick the right frame of reference in which the measurements are simultaneous. In our case, when we make a measurement of the ruler in the unprimed frame of reference, we have to make sure that delta t unprimed is equal to zero. So it is important to take delta t, not delta t prime, equal to zero. And when we do it, we immediately get the result. We find the relation between the length of the ruler in its own co-moving reference frame, delta x prime, with the length of the same ruler in a frame in which it is moving with velocity v. That length is delta x, and delta x is smaller than delta x prime which means that the moving ruler is simply getting shorter. There you go. Another interesting effect due to relativity. It's called Lorentz contraction. And again, it's a straightforward consequence of our geometric interpretation of motion as a hyperbolic rotation of space-time. So these things become quite trivial once we embrace that unusual interpretation of motion. <laughs> So let us summarize our crazy results. On one hand, we have time dilation, 
which states that time of moving clock slows down. On the other hand, the length of moving objects contracts along the direction of motion, that's called the Lorentz contraction. And what is interesting here is that both of these effects are dictated by the same factor, the same square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, that is called the Lorentz factor. And this is no coincidence. In fact, it turns out that if the time dilation effect is true, so must be the Lorentz contraction. One simply cannot live without the other. So imagine that there are two cities, city A and another city B, that are separated by exactly 100 kilometers. And suppose that there is a car that goes from A to B at the exact speed of 100 km per hour. So if you expected the trip to take exactly one hour, think again, because relativity makes it shorter. Yes, that is true. The trip will take shorter than one hour. And the reason for this is that the watch on the driver's wrist, from the perspective of a policeman standing next to the road, will undergo time dilation. It will just tick at a slower rate. Therefore, when the driver arrives at B, he will discover that his watch has aged less than one hour. And the policeman standing next to the road has a simple explanation of that fact. Time dilation. Right, but what about the driver? In his own frame of reference, his watch is standing still. And therefore, there is no time dilation whatsoever. So how does he understand this outcome that he arrives at the destination before one hour. It is true that his watch is standing still, but everything else outside of the car is moving in the opposite direction. And therefore, it all undergoes Lorentz contraction. And that includes the distance between the city A and city B. That distance contracts. And that's why he can arrive at the destination before one hour. Not because of the time dilation, but because of the length contraction. <laughs> And now you can see that we need both of these effects in order to preserve consistency between all frames of reference. And this is the beauty of Galilean principle of relativity. You can pick whatever frame of reference you want and describe the situation in that frame, and the outcome will be completely consistent with all other possible points of view. In the next episode, I'm going to discuss some original riddles and puzzles of special relativity, as well as paradoxes, or shall I say, apparent paradoxes of the theory. Also, if you'd like to go into more details of the problems I discuss, get your copy of my textbook on relativity. It's called Unusually Special Relativity. The link is in the description. But now I'm going to put these Lorentz contractions and time dilations into some practical tests. See ya!